हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम अदिति वेलकम टू माय चैनल लाइब्रेरी माउस टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू रीड अ बुक हाउ टू डेवलप सेल्फ कॉन्फिडेंस एंड इन्फ्लुएंस पीपल बाय पब्लिक स्पीकिंग बाय डेल कानिगी दिस बुक कंटेन ट्वेल्व चैप्टर्स सो लेट्स कंटिन्यू विथ चैप्टर टेन हाउ टू मेक योर मीनिंग क्लियर अ फेमस इंग्लिश बाई सॉप ड्यूरिंग वर्ल्ड वॉर वन spoke to some unlettered troops at camp opton they were on their way to the trenches but a very small percentage of them had any adequate idea why they were being sent i know i questioned them yet the lord by shop talked to these men about international amity and sir by's right to a place in the sun why the half of them did not know whether sir why was a town or a disease he might as well as far as results were concerned have delivered a sonorous eulogy on the nebular hypothesis however not a single trooper left the hall while he was speaking the military police with revolvers were stationed at every exit to prevent it i do not wish to belittle the bishop before a body of collegiate men he would probably have been powerful but he failed with these soldiers and he failed utterly he did not know his audience and he evidently knew neither the precise purpose of his talk nor how to accomplish it what do you mean by the purpose of an address just this every talk regardless of whether the speaker realizes it or not has one or four major goals what are they first to make something clear second to impress and convenience third to get action fourth to get entertain let us illustrate these by a series of concrete examples lin klon who has always more or less interested in mechanisms once invented and patented a device for lifting standard boats off sandbars and other obstructions he worked in a mechanic shop near his law office making a model of his apertures all through the device finally came to naught he was decidedly enthusiastic over its possibilities when friends came to his office to view his model he took no end of pains to explain it the main purpose of those explanations was clearness when he delivered his immortal oration at gettysburg when he gave his first and second inaugural addresses when henry clay died and lincoln delivered a eulogy on his life on all these occasions lincoln's main purpose was impressiveness and convictions he had to be clear of course before he could be convincing but in this instance clearness was not his major consideration in his talk to juries he tried to win favorable decisions in his political talks he tried to win votes his purpose then was action two years before he was elected president lincoln prepared a lecture on inventions his purpose was entertainment at least that should have been his goal but he was evidently not very successful in attaining it his career as a popular lecturer was in fact a distinct disappointment in one town not a person came to hear him but he did succeed and he succeeded famously in the other speeches of his that i have referred to and why because in those instances he knew his goal and he knew how to achieve it he knew where he wanted to go and how to get there and because so many speakers don't know just that they often flounder and come to grief for example i once saw a united states congressman hooted and hissed and forced to leave the stage of the old new york hippodrome because he had unconsciously no doubt but nevertheless unwisely chosen clearness as his goal it was during the war he talked to his audience about how the united states was preparing 
द क्राउड डिड नॉट वॉन्ट टू बी इंस्ट्रक्टेड दे वॉन्टेड टू बी इंटरटेन्ड दे लिसन टू हिम पेशेंसली पोलाइटली फॉर टेन मिनट्स अ क्वार्टर ऑफ एन आवर होपिंग द परफॉर्मेंस वुड कम टू अ रैपिड एंड बट इट डिड नॉट हि रैम्बल्ड ऑन एंड ऑन पेशेंस स्नैप्ड द ऑडियंस वुड नॉट स्टैंड फॉर मोर सम वन वी गेन टू चेयर आयरनिकली अदर्स टू किट अप इन अ मोमेंट अ थाउजेंड पीपल वी आर रिस्लिंग एंड शाउटिंग द स्पीकर अपट्यूज एंड इनकेपेबल एज ही वॉज ऑफ सेंसिंग द टेम्पर ऑफ हिस ऑडियंस हैड द बैड टेस्ट टू कंटिन्यू डेट अराउज दैम अ बैटल वॉज ऑन देअर इम्पेशंस माउंटेड टू एर दे डिटरमाइंड टू साइलेंस हेम लाउडर एंड लाउडर ग्रू दियर स्ट्रोम ऑफ प्रोटेस्ट फाइनली द रोर ऑफ इट द एंगर ऑफ इट ड्रोव हिज वर्ड्स ही कुड नॉट हैव बीन हर्ड ट्वेंटी फीट अवे सो ही वॉज फोर्स टू गिव अप एक्नोलेज डिफीट एंड रिटायर इन ह्यूमिलेशन प्रॉफिट बाई हिज एग्जाम्पल नोन योर गोल चूज इट वाइजली बिफोर यू सेट आउट टू प्रिपेयर योर टॉक नो हाउ टू रीच इट देन सेट अबाउट इट डूइंग इट स्किलफुली एंड विथ साइंस Use comparisons to promote clearness. As to clearness, do not underestimate the importance of it or the difficulty. I once heard a certain Irish poet giving an evening of reading from his own poems. Not ten percent of the audience, half the time, knew what he was talking about. Many talkers, both in public and private, are a lot like that. When I discussed the essentials of public speaking with Sir Oliver Lodge, a man who had been lecturing to university classes and to the public for forty years, he emphasized most of all the importance first of knowledge and preparation, second of talking good pains to be clear. General von Moltke, at the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War, said to his officers. Remember gentlemen that any order that can be misunderstood will be misunderstood Napoleon recognized the same danger his most emphatic and oft reiterated instruction to his secretaries was be clear be clear when the disciples asked Christ why he taught the public by parables he answered because they seeing see not and hearing hear not neither do they understand and when you talk on a subject strange to your hearer or hearers can you hope that they will understand you any more readily than people understood the master hardly so what can we do about it what did he do when confronted by a similar situation solved it in the most simple and natural manner imaginable described the things people did not know by likening them to things they did know the kingdom of heaven what would it be like how could those untortured peasants of palestine know so christ described it in terms of objects and actions with which they were already familiar the kingdom of heaven is like on to live in which a woman took and hate in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea that was lucid they could understand that the housewives in the audience were using leaven every week the fishermen were casting their nets into the sea daily the merchants were dealing in pearls and how did david make clear the watchfulness and loving kindness of jehovah the lord is my spirit i shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leteth me beside the still waters green grazing grounds in that almost barren country still waters where the sheep could drink those pastoral people could understand that here is rather striking and half assuming example of the use of the principle some missionaries were translating the bible into the dialect of a tribe living near equatorial africa 
they progress to the worse. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. How were they to translate that? Literally meaningless, absurd. The natives had never scooped off the sidewalk on a February morning. They did not even have a word for snow. They could not have told the difference between snow and coal tar. But they had climbed coconut trees many times and shaken down a few nuts for lunch. So the missionaries linked the unknown to the known and changed the words to read. Through your scenes be as scarlet. They shall be as white as the meat of a coconut. Under the circumstances, it would be hard to improve on that, wouldn't it? At the State Teachers College at Warrensburg, Missouri, I once heard a lecturer on Alaska who failed in many places to be either clear or interesting because, unlike those American missionaries, he neglected to talk in terms of what his audience knew. He told us, for example, that Alaska had a gross area of 5,90,804 square miles for a population of 64,356. Half a million square miles, what does that mean to the average man? Precious little, he is not used to thinking in terms of square miles. They conjure up no mental picture. He does not have any idea whether half a million square miles are approximately the size of Maine or Texas. Suppose the speaker had said that the coastline of Alaska had its island in longer than distance around the globe, and that its area more than equals the combined areas of Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Would not that give everyone a fairly clear conception of the area of Alaska? He said the population was 64,356. The chances are that not one person in 10 remembered the census figure for 5 minutes or even 1 minute. Why? Because the rapid saying of 64,356 does not make a very clear impression. It leaves only a loose, insecure impressions like words written on the sand of the sea hole. The next wave of attention quite obliterates them. Would it not have been better to have stated the senses in terms of something with which they were familiar? For example, St. Joseph was not very far away from the little Missouri town where the audience lived. Many of them had been to St. Joseph and Alaska had, at that time, 10,000 fewer people than St. Joseph. Better still, why not talk about Alaska in terms of the very town where you are speaking? Would not the speaker have been far clearer had he said, Alaska is eight times as large as the state of Missouri, yet it has only 13 times as many people as live right here in Warrensburg. In the following illustrations, which are the clearer, the A statement or the B? A. Our nearest star is 55 million miles away. B. A train going at the rear of mile a minute would reach our nearest star in 48 million years. If a song were sung there and the sound could travel here, it would be 3 million, 800,000 years before we could hear it. A spider's thread reaching to it would weigh 500 tons. A. St. Peter's, the biggest church in the world, is 232 yards long and 364 feet wide. B. It is about the size of two buildings like the Capitol at Washington built on top of one another. Sir Oliver Lodge happily used this method when explaining the size and nature of atoms to a popular audience. I heard him tell a European audience that there were as many atoms in a drop of water as there were drops of water in the Mediterranean Sea. 
and many of his hearers had spent over a week sailing from Gibraltar to the Suez Canal to bring the matter still closer home. He said there were as many atoms in one drop of water as there were blades of grass on the earth. Richard Harding Davis told a New York audience that the Moscow of St. Sophia was about as big as the auditorium of the 5th Avenue Theatre. He said, Brindisi looks like Long Island City when you come into it from the rear. Use this principle henceforth in your talks. If you are describing the Great Pyramid, first tell your hearers it is 451 feet then tell them how high that it is in terms of some building they see every day. Tell how many city blocks the base would cover. Don't speak about so many thousand gallons of this or so many hundred thousand barrels of that without also telling how many rooms the size of the one you are speaking in could be filled with that much liquid. Instead of saying 20 feet high, why not say one and a half times as high as this ceiling? Instead of talking about distance in terms of road or miles, it is not clearer to say as far as from here to the Union Station or to such and such a street. Thank you so much for listening it and I hope it is understandable to you. If you enjoy watching my videos, do like, subscribe and share with your family and friends. Thank you.